What's the most common arrhythmia in the United States or any state? It is, of course, atrial arrhythmias. So this is one of the ones you have to know to the marrow of its bones. Atrial arrhythmias, particularly atrial fibrillation, means instead of the rhythm originating from the SA node, it's originating diffusely throughout the atrium. That's why you don't have any distinct P waves. Now that's different than, say, multifocal atrial tachycardia, which is multiple P waves of different morphologies in association with COPD. MAT, you do have P waves. Flutter, you don't exactly have P waves, you have flutter waves, but atrial fibrillation means non-distinct sourcing, but it's in the atrium. Palpitations is very non-specific. 50% of people have palpitations actually have no illness. They're just anxious or they just have a subjective sensation of fluttering. There's no illness at all. But when you see palpitations on your step three exam, it always means EKG. And if the EKG is normal, Holter monitor, which is an ambulatory 24-hour rhythm monitor, or if it's severe enough, inpatient telemetry monitoring. What will a Holter show you that telemetry monitoring will not? Nothing. The Holter does not add anything. So if you have an inpatient telemetry monitoring, Holter is not going to add anything for the detection of it. So atrial fibrillation can happen with no history. You don't have to have hypertension. You don't have to have dilation. You don't have to have ischemia. You don't have to have any anatomic abnormality. It can just happen. What we know is that anatomic abnormalities of the heart make it just much more likely. The more anatomically abnormal the atrium is, the more likely you are to have AFib. It's not exactly an ischemic rhythm. It is because ischemia can dilate the heart. It's not really from valvular disease, except that valvular disease can dilate the heart. Can methyl xanthines, can caffeine cause AFib? Not really, not exactly. Can take a person who's predisposed to atrial fibrillation, such as people who have a dilated cardiomyopathy, and make you feel palpitations and push you into it, but just having coffee by itself is highly unlikely to be causing AFib. You have palpitations from caffeine by itself. So what the clotting disorder can cause atrial fibrillation? A clot? Pulmonary embolus. Blocking the flow of blood out of the heart. Pulmonary embolus can cause that atrial fibrillation by blocking the flow out of, of blood out of the heart. It stretches up that atrium and you get AFib. If the EKG does not show the answer, you'll do Holter or telemetry monitoring. Here is a normal P wave, P, Q, R, S, and T. Here's fibrillation. Now, it's not just that the fibrillation has these fibrillatory waves, which are very irregular. You notice how the R to R intervals are different? This R to R is different than this one, is different than this one, is different than this one. It's not just that the fibrillatory waves are irregularly irregular. It's the R to R intervals are irregularly irregular. You can do continuous ambulatory monitoring for as long as you want. You can put in an implantable loop recorder, which will give you an ability to actually click on something that says when you have symptoms, an event monitor. And the standard is you put on this electrical monitor and you wear the wires for a day, and then it is instantly <coughs> analyzed to see oh, where you have PVCs, VPCs, fib, and flutter. What do you do if the Holter monitor shows ectopy that are not atrial fibrillation. In other words, atrial premature contractions, ventricular premature contractions. What do you do about them? Nothing. Nothing. You don't like atrial premature contractions. You don't like ventricular premature contractions, but you don't do anything about them. What do you do to treat fibrillation? Now, 99.9% .9 or more of fib is not hemodynamically unstable. Atrial fibrillation is rarely associated with hemodynamic instability. But let's say that it was associated with un instability. What is the next best step in the management of the patient if it actually said the patient is hemodynamic unst unstable? So again, I want to be clear about something. It's not that you'll see it. 
that it really is there, but if it is there, it's like finding $20 bills on the street. It's not that you see it, but if it is there, you'll act on it. And if they are unstable, you do immediate cardioversion. What type of cardioversion? Synchronized or unsynchronized? Synchronized cardioversion. Synchronized. You're synchronizing it to, you're synchronizing it to the QRS and so that you don't give the electricity inside, you don't give the electricity in the refractory period. So, because if you give electricity in the refractory period, you can make it worse. So you're not sitting there going, timing it like, when do I hit the electricity, man? The machine does it for you. Immediate synchronized cardioversion right away if you are unstable. No excluding clots, no anticoagulation, no NOAC, straight to shock. What does it mean to be unstable? The same as it is for all the other disorders. Chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, confusion. Chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, confusion means you're not getting enough perfusion. So that's what we mean by hemodynamic instability. You can't let somebody go with chest pain, they'll infarct. You can't let somebody go with hemodynamically related confusion. Somebody once said to me, you know, but people with dementia, they're confused. We don't mean dementia, we mean hemodynamically related confusion. Lots of people have congested fil- No, we mean acute fluid buildup in your lungs because you've lost your atrial contribution. You see, normally your atrial contribution should be not more than 10 or 20% of cardiac output. But if you have a sick heart, cardiomyopathy, a leaky heart, valve disease, then if you go into AFib or flutter, you can lose 30 or 40 or 50% of your cardiac output by just going into the arrhythmia. 99.9% of patients with AFib and flutter are going to be hemodynamically stable. The first thing to do in a hemodynamically stable person is to control the rate, if it's rapid. You control the rate with a beta blocker, a calcium blocker, or digoxin. Now, any beta blocker will work to control it. Esmolol is IV, metoprolol and carvedilol. Uh, well, metoprolol can be IV or oral, but they're all, these two are generally used orally. Now, not all calcium blockers are going to control the rate. Only a few, only two really, diltiazem and verapamil, are going to control heart rate. As a matter of fact, nifedipine actually can speed the heart rate. Nifedipine can have a reflex tachycardia and speed the heart rate. So calcium channel blockers are not all the same. So just like going to a restaurant, you can't just say, I want a chicken, give me a chicken, I want to eat a chicken. You have to say, well, what kind? So you can't just order calcium blocker. You have to say, I want some diltiazem. You can't just say beta blocker. I want some metoprolol. So unless we say a specific reference to say essential tremor or propranolol for migraine prophylaxis or stage fright and social anxiety disorder and beta blockers propranolol, you can just go through life knowing metoprolol. Now one other medication will control the rate. It's sort of fallen out of fashion. But the joxin can control the rate in, in AFib quite nicely. Now, there is a time when the joxin actually is better than the other meds. Do you know what circumstance that might be? When somebody has hypotension, because the joxin is the only one that doesn't lower blood pressure. So in the acute setting, you'd give it intravenously because you want to have an immediate effect. But it, if you're in the office, which is going to be 99% of it, Oral therapy is sufficient. Unstable synchronized cardioversion. Stable rate control. What if they're already rate controlled or you get the rate control done with these medications? If it's chronic, and chronic for AFib means more than two days, you start to develop a risk of having a clot in the heart. Now, if you have a risk of clot in the heart, then it's time to look at anticoagulation. If they don't state the duration, you're going to say it's longer than two days. So people who have no clear uh, duration of the, uh, of the AFib is going to automatically be assumed to be more, two day, more than two days. All right. Now's really where we start.
the main guts of AFib management. And this is big important. Shocking unstable people is not going to be a problem for you. Not saying something dumb like wait to anticoagulate them might be a problem for some of you. Getting rate control with these medications is not going to be a problem for you. The problem is going to be anticoagulation because the reason that people get it wrong is that they often answer based on what they saw their attendings doing. And if you saw your attending giving IV heparin, you're going to get it wrong. If you saw your attending giving low molecular weight heparin, you're going to get it wrong. There is no reason to use heparin or low molecular weight heparin to anticoagulate AFib because even if you had a clot in the heart, these medications become therapeutic within the hour. And compared to heparin and low molecular weight heparin, they have the same or better efficacy and fewer adverse effects. Compared to warfarin, they have the same or better efficacy and fewer adverse effects. If you get to a point in your life on this test and you go, boy, oh boy, I got this circumstance. Do I answer what Fisher told me or do I answer what I've seen? Answer what Fisher told you and you're safe. You don't have to agree with me. You just have to answer what I say. Rate control and anticoagulation, cardioversion, either with meds or DC cardioversion, you have these two choices in your hand. Which one do you choose? And the answer is rate control and anticoagulation. Routine cardioversion is not needed. Why not? Hey, Fisher, you're such an ass. Do you want to just leave those people? You just want to leave those people in AFib and let them just have rate control and an anticoagulant? Why don't you cardiovert them? Well, there has to be a reason for that. You can cardiovert somewhat medications. Quinidine, propafenone, all the various medications that are been used for decades for cardioversion. You can electrically cardiovert them in a safe laboratory. But here's the problem. What makes people go into atrial fibrillation in the first place is most often cardiomyopathy, hypertension-induced cardiomyopathy, dilated left atrium. Does your cardioversion change the fundamental nature of the shape of the heart? Nope. It was a dilated atrium before. It's a dilated atrium now. So shocking someone is not going to change the shape of the heart. So if you cardiovert them into sinus, they won't stay there. And 93% of people end up back in atrial fibrillation. Only 7% will actually stay in sinus. Well, you go, well, why not? Maybe that's a good 7%. Take a shot. Well, it turns out that 7% or so is the rate of spontaneous conversion into sinus. So why shock someone or med them into sinus when they would have gone there anyway? Rate control and anticoagulation is better or equal than routine electrical and medical cardioversion because they don't stay in sinus and some would have spontaneously converted anyway. How do you know who needs anticoagulation? So first of all, you have to have two things. AFib flutter for more than two days. In other words, if you just have a night of AFib, uh, let's say that you're, you know, you're having holiday heart syndrome or you just had AFib for no particular reason and it just happened, you don't need to anticoagulate someone for a day of AFib. People have transient arrhythmias. So don't anticoagulate them. Okay, what if it's become chronic, meaning it's gone on for days and days and weeks? You'd anticoagulate them if they had this score that they have a dilated cardiomyopathy, one point. Hypertension, one point. Age greater than 75 is actually two points. A CHADS VASC score of two or more gets anticoagulation. Diabetes is one point. Stroke, if you've had a stroke or TIA, automatically it means chronic AFib. You've had stroke or TIA, better anticoagulate before you have another one. Or vascular disease. What does that mean? Oh, the same things that we used statins for. 
coronary disease, carotid disease, cerebral disease, peripheral arterial disease, aortic disease. The vascular disease is a point. Now, intermediate age is one point, and having female gender. So if you have a two or more, you're going to get anticoagulated. I don't know why we call it sex female. Maybe we should call it gender. And then gender, female gender. And then instead of a Chad's Vask, well, I don't even know what the C is at the end. Maybe nobody wants to say Chad's Voss. And we call it gender instead of a Chad's Vask. With gender at the end, it would become a Chad's Vag score. You say to the patient, sorry, sir, your Chad's Vag is really high. You need anticoagulation. Well, now you know why it's called Chad's Vask with sex, so we don't say Chad's Vag. So here's your other super big point, which is the people who are going to have the hardest time are the ones who are going to answer what they saw older doctors doing. And those people are still using heparin. They're still using warfarin. Warfarin is a drug that should go away except for metal valves and mitral stenosis. Someday when your kid's in medical school, he's going to say, Hey mom, did you guys used to use this stuff called warfarin in medical school? Oh my God. Didn't it make you bleed so much? So the rivaruxaban, apixaban, edoxaban, or dabigatran all have better efficacy and fewer adverse effects compared to Warfarin. And warfarin should not be used except that there's metal valves or mitral stenosis because the NOAX have better efficacy and less bleeding than warfarin does. And they also treat DVT and pulmonary embolus too. So for a DVT, you shouldn't be using anything except the NOAC. It's therapeutic right away. You don't have to do INR monitoring. And for a hemodynamically stable pulmonary embolus, they're just as great too. Now, for a while, people didn't used to like to use the drugs because they're afraid of them because they're like, oh my God, we don't have a reversal agent. And I used to say, well, I don't get as worried about reversing a bleed that doesn't happen if you're worried about, like, you want to use something like warfarin where you can reverse it, I'd rather just not get the bleed to begin with. But it's solved now because the unpronounceable idorucizumab, idorucizumab, idorucizumab reverses dabigatran and andexanet. See how it has an X at the 10A in the middle? It has a 10A in the middle. That must be it. Andexanet with the 10A in the middle, in the middle reverses the other 10A inhibitors. Now, Warfarin is the answer for these two. And remember, because you're maintaining the INR really high, you have an even greater risk of bleeding because of the really high INR. Now, if you have bleeding from warfarin and you got a really high INR, what's the therapy to reverse the warfarin? Not fresh frozen plasma. The therapy to reverse warfarin, PCC, prothrombin complex concentrate, which is giving factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, 2, 7, 9, and 10, and also also protein C and protein S. So if you did have a bleed from it, you'd use PCC to reverse it. When is heparin the answer for AFib? Not needed. Not needed. Bridging when you're going to have procedures, not needed, not needed. Now, one thing would be if you had a metal valve and you needed anticoagulation in the first trimester of pregnancy, you would use heparin. But we're not talking about metal valves in pregnancy. We're talking about stroke prophylaxis with AFib. So it's never needed, even when you stop a NOAC for a day or two. And when you need surgery or colonoscopy and biopsy, you're only stopping NOACs for a day. That's why you don't have to bridge with heparin. Have you heard of this? That routine cardioversion is not indicated? It's not because they convert back into sinus. All right, how are you going to manage atrial flutter different than the atrial fibrillation? The answer is you're not going to manage a difference. It's uh, really about the, the same, except the EKG pattern is, is different.
Uh, if you have it for more than two days and you have a Chad's Vask of two or more, you'll anticoagulate it. If it's only there for a day and you have atrial flutter, and because atrial flutter is a much more regular rhythm, it's a regular rhythm in a reentrant rhythm in a, in a, a reproducible pattern, the difference is the EKG pattern. Other than that, the management is largely the same. If it happens to be rarely unstable, you'll shock it. The criteria for instability, chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, confusion, are the same. So what's the difference? The EKG is the difference. Ooh, isn't that gorgeous? That's so nice. Look at that. Flutter waves, flutter waves. When I was a medical student, I loved flutter because I think it was like the first EKG. I'm like, yeah, I know what that is, man. Look at that. Flutter, 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 flutter. Sawtooth pattern. Flutter, flutter. Oh, also, did you notice that in flutter, the R to R's to R to R are regular with R to R. The R's to R is regular. The flutter waves are regular. The flutter waves are regular. The R to R's are regular. In fib, it's not just that the fibrillatory waves are irregular, so is the R to R irregular. Fibrillation, fibrillatory waves, completely irregular. R to R is completely irregular. Flutter, the flutters are regular, the R's, the flutters are regular, and the R's to R should be too. MAT is an arrhythmia, an atrial arrhythmia that happens in association with COPD. It'll show multiple P wave morphologies, but there's still P waves in MAT. Ultimately, how do you choose the drug for your rate control? Step three will expect you to be able to do the multiple things of knowing that if you have AFib or flutter, you would be expected to know that there's a person who's got ischemic disease. Oh, that's a definite clear choice for beta blockers. Oh, you have asthma. Oh, it's a definite clear choice not for beta blockers. Oh, you have a person who's also got a blood pressure of 92 over 70. Oh, definitely not beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. You will be expected to do multifactorial, multi-cause and say, oh, it's from Graves' disease and hyperthyroidism, definitely a beta blocker. So you would be expected to know that there's both diseases and to be able to say, I need a drug that will treat both things. Multifocal atrial tachycardia, COPD, which damages and dilates your right atrium. Multifocal, more than one site at which the P wave originates. Atrial tachycardia, it's a narrow or normal co complex, narrow or normal QRS complex. Multifocal, three P wave morphologies. Atrial, meaning that below the QRS, below the AV node, it's a normal or narrow QRS complex. And it's tachycardia. So what's the difference if this was slow? You know what you'd call this if it was slow? It'd be called a wandering atrial pacemaker. What a fantastic poetic term is that? What a fantastic poetic term, wandering atrial pacemaker, meaning that MAT, the T makes it MAT. And if it's slow, it is a wandering pacemaker. So what you see here is that the rate is fast. And what you'll see here is multiple P wave morphologies. The rate is fast, the rate is fast, and there's multiple P wave morphologies, and that makes it MAT. Now, because it's in association with lung disease, we're going to avoid beta blockers. And that's why the treatment of choice for MAT is calcium blocker. But which type of calcium blocker? The deltaism because remember, nifedipine, amlodipine, nitrendipine, nicardipine, philodipine, speed the heart rate by reflex tachycardia. They don't block the AV node. Diltiazem and verapamil will block the AV node. Superventricular tachycardia 
is never chronic. Supraventricular tachycardia has to be treated acutely. You can't leave someone in supraventricular tachycardia and hope to just anticoagulate them. Supraventricular tachycardia runs at a heart rate of 160, 170, can never be chronic. It's not anticoagulated because it's not going to be chronic. Like all atrial arrhythmias and all arrhythmias, it can cause palpitations. And it's not associated with either ischemic disease or is it associated with a dilated cardiomyopathy. It is associated with an abnormal wiring around the heart's AV node. And because it's associated with an abnormal wiring around the AV node, the ultimate treatment for SVT is to fix that abnormal wiring. So, will you shock SVT if it was unstable? What's different about the criteria for instability compared to AFib or A-flutter? There isn't any. The diagnostic test, like all arrhythmias, is an EKG, and if the EKG is negative, the ambulatory holter or the inpatient telemetry. Now, the difference between SVT and the other atrial arrhythmias is that you see a very distinct pattern, and it always has to be treated immediately. This is a narrow, complex tachycardia. What do we mean by narrow? Meaning a QRS that is normal, less than 100 milliseconds. Although technically you can go up to 120, this is less than 100 milliseconds. Do you see P waves? I don't see P waves. Do you see fibrillatory waves? I don't see fibrillatory waves. Do you see flutter waves? I don't see flutter waves. It's superventricular tachycardia. What is the next best step in the management of this patient? Carotid sinus massage. What if the carotid sinus massage does not work? Adenosine. Do you see fibrillatory waves? I don't see fibrillatory waves. Do you see flutter waves? I don't see flutter waves. Is this a normal complex or is it a wide complex? Each small box is eight, uh, 40 milliseconds. This is like two small boxes, two small boxes. It's under 100 milliseconds. This is a normal complex tachycardia, normal or narrow complex tachycardia. It doesn't, it doesn't get shocked unless it is unstable. A narrow complex tachycardia with no P waves, no fibrillatory waves, no flutter waves. It is SVT. What is the next best step in the management of this patient? Carotid sinus massage. What do you do if the carotid sinus massage does not work? Adenosine. So here it is, a person who pops into supraventricular tachycardia. It's almost never unstable, and the next step in SVT is to try and break it with carotid sinus massage, and if it doesn't work, adenosine. If adenosine does not work for these, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, digoxin, but adenosine first. And what if you're not certain and you go, you know what? That's so rapid. I can't be sure that there's not atrial fibrillation in there. Because it's really rapid. Maybe it's really rapid AFib. Good point. Maybe it's really rapid AFib and I just can't see the fibrillatory waves. Maybe it's really rapid AFib and I just can't see the fibrillatory waves. Then you know what the answer is? The same thing. Carotid massage and adenosine because adenosine won't work for anything except supraventricular tachycardia. So the great thing is it's both diagnostic and therapeutic. So after you fix all arrhythmias, all of them, you should get an echo. Now, why? What's the point? Because you need to see if there's a clot in there. Because if the Chad's vasque is zero, but you have a clot, you need to be anticoagulated. What's the other thing is, Maybe you'll see a valvular disease that you can fix. What if you find that there is mitral stenosis? You're going to have to do a balloon dilation. What if you find a vegetation? What if you find that there's mitral regurge with an ejection fraction less than 60% or a left ventricular end systolic diameter greater than 40 millimeters? Then you would have to fix it. So everybody afterwards on CCS should get an echo. Because every arrhythmia, 
automatically should have anatomic abnormalities excluded. And even though I said that most of these atrial arrhythmias are not from ischemia, you will never lose points by saying, get a stress test and rule out ischemia. Let me guess, have you ever heard about what to do for an unstable arrhythmia? Have you ever heard that chest pain, can't perfuse my coronary shortness of breath, hypotension confusion? You ever heard that? You ever sing the song? Well, if you're unstable, synchronized cardioversion. And if you're stable, have you ever heard about vagal maneuvers? Carotid sinus massage, ice water immersion, dive, 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 circumferential digital rectal exam, and adenosine. Supraventricular tachycardia is a re-entrant rhythm around the AV node. And you've got to zap it for a supraventricular tachycardia after you get, after you get it converted with adenosine. I'm not sure if it's AFib or it's a supraventricular tachycardia. Adenosine is both diagnostic and therapeutic. I fixed it, I broke it, you're in sinus. See these arrhythmias here in a circle around there? You got to fix it to cut it out, to, to burn it out with a catheter so that it doesn't recur. There is nobody living that should be living in a place in a the quote unquote resource rich country that should be living with chronic SVT. It can be fixed in 20 minutes in electrophysiology laboratory. The vagal maneuvers really do work. The adenosine really does work. And then the catheter ablation, you put a catheter, you heat it up to 95 degrees, and you've cooked it out, burnt it out, and it's cured. Cured, cured, cured. It's miraculous. Cured, 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 cured. How are you gonna tell that different from Wolf Parkinson White? Wolf Parkinson White is a piece of neuralized muscle tissue that goes around the AV node. And this piece of neuralized muscle tissue around the AV node makes it so you prematurely contract, prematurely depolarize the ventricle. Now, because you're going down the normal his Purkinje system after the AV node, the complexes are narrow, less than 100 milliseconds. That's what we mean, a narrow complex, less than 100. But the difference between Wolf Parkinson White and the others is a couple of things. Number one, it's the only thing that gives both a supraventricular tachycardia, alternated with ventricular tachycardia, and you could have either one. Number two, this abnormal neuralized piece of muscle bypassing the normal AV node can be cut and fixed. And you go, well, that's the same as SVT. That's true, but you see it on an EKG as a short PR. So the last thing that's different about it is that if you give the normal calcium blocker or digoxin that you would for anybody with SVT, you'll block the normal AV node and shove the complexes down the abnormal tract. And you'll get this abnormal premature conduction of <clears throat> To the, eight, to the ventricle, from the atrium to the ventricle. This is normal, SA, AV down, SA, AV down. The normal PR is 120 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds. 120 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds is the normal PR interval. All right. Wolf Parkinson White has a bypass tract. And because it has this abnormal bypass tract, it prematurely contracts the ventricle. And what you end up having is a delta wave, a short PR, a delta wave and a short PR, a delta wave, a short PR, short PR, an early depolarization of the ventricle. And that's what makes it so that you can have supraventricular tachycardia or ventricular tachycardia. No digoxin, no calcium blockers, because the digoxin, the calcium blockers will block the normal AV node. So you have SVT alternating with VTAC, and so beta blockers are equivocal. Sometimes they're safe, sometimes they're not. But what drug, if you have SVT and VTAC, you need a drug that will treat both an atrial arrhythmia and a ventricular arrhythmia. Lidocaine only treats ventricular arrhythmias. Oh, medications like quinidine only treat atrial arrhythmias. 
So you use something like procainamide or amiodarone to treat both. So you block both places. So the best initial diagnostic test is the EKG. The delta wave is after the short PR. Premature contraction of the, of the uh, ventricle. Premature contraction early bump on the delta wave. The most accurate test is electrophysiology studies. Well, why do I need electrophysiology studies? I can see here, that's a short PR. That's a short PR. And I see this thing, that's a delta wave. It's a delta wave. That's a delta wave. Why do I need the electrophysiology study when I can see the delta wave? Why do I need the electrophysiology study when I can see the delta wave? And you need the electrophysiology study not to diagnose that it's a delta wave and a short PR, but to see the location. So what? Why do I need the location? So I can fix it. I need the location so I can cook it out in electrophysiology studies. And if you have the arrhythmia right now, supraventricular tachycardia or VTAC, I use amiodarone or procainamide because it blocks both the, the supraventricular arrhythmia and the ventricular arrhythmia. Procainamide or amiodarone. But I need the EP study to burn out, to cut that abnormal conduction tract so it is cured. Cured. What do you do when you're tired and you want to stop? And the preparation for step three, no matter who you are, I'm telling you this is going to be hard. Why? Because one, the international graduates need step three for their visa. So they're in a mad hot panic because they're like, oh my God, if I don't do that, I can't get my step, my, my visa. The people who are the U.S. graduates and residencies like, please just let this be over with. I don't want to learn this. So what do you do? The people who did crappy on step one and two need a good step three score to convince program directors that they're better than their step one and two score. So the world is filled with anxiety and tiredness. So how are you going to get some energy when you're anxious and tired and you want to stop? You go back to remembering why we are doing this in the first place. You go back to it and you say the point of medicine is not just to be able to hand out the pills and the meds. It is because there are artists and poets and philosophers and musicians that need to be staying alive and healthy enough to create art, music, poetry, love, romance, goodness, hope. And that's why we're doing this, and that's the kind of energy that you have. So I am sending you that energy now to remind you of why you went to medical school and what they're doing this for. You know what we're doing? We're keeping poets alive.